Welcome to the CTSNet Roundtable, which is part of the CTSNet COVID-19 Resources for Cardiac and Thoracic Surgeons. My name is Dr. Joanna Chikwi. I am Chairman of Cardiac Surgery at Cedars sinai in Los Angeles, and I'm interviewing Dr. Tor Sant today. He is the Chief of the Division of Cardiac Surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and also past President of the AATS. Welcome, Dr. Sunt. Thank you very much for joining us. Past president of CTSNet, too. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I've got a few questions to ask, and a number of people sort of sent in questions. And let's just start with a sort of broader picture. Um, from your viewpoint, is the difference in ability of countries and regions to coordinate care at a regional level going to impact how we deliver care to our cardiac surgical patients? Now, sadly, I think it will. I think the truth is that this has been an issue, uh, underlying issue in our healthcare system. Some say we don't have a system, so that's a, a, a false term. Um, but the lack of, of connection and coordination uh, to provide expertise uh, is, a, is, a, has a, is a longstanding problem. In fact, that was the focus really the, the motivation behind the document that was written with the American College of Cardiology about the management of valve disease, even long before the COVID issue, was how do, how do the healthcare uh, resources get coordinated so that we can best match uh, the patients to the, to, the, uh, to the available resources, whether those resources are surgical expertise or material resources, whatever. So I think that that's a problem, and uh, and I I always try to see the bright side, and I think that this uh, crisis is going to help us to learn and develop how how we need to to develop these uh, networks of care, if you will. So not only did we learn about the benefits of regionalizing care from countries like Italy um, that were ahead of us in this way, we also learned a lot about how to prepare. Um, what have you been doing in preparation for the surge? Well, the, um, uh, the division itself has done its part in, in deferring all deferrable cases. It's always a challenge to, to, to determine what can be deferred and how long it can be deferred, and we can get into that. But uh, that's what we've done uh, specifically as a, as a division. The institution as a whole, is, I think, has done a, a wonderful job uh, of uh, ramping up capacity. We're in, we've uh, phased how we can increase the number of ICU beds. We're basically uh, going to have quadrupled the number of ICU beds by uh, trans, uh, transforming the, the, the poster care unit, the PACU, the, uh, into an ICU setting, uh, et cetera. So the institution itself, we've got a nice disaster uh, preparedness, a great disaster preparedness group here. Paul Binninger is the one who leads that. And uh, they've been coordinating the institutional response to this in a, in a great way. So right now, where are you in terms of um, cardiac surgery operating ICU capacity preparedness for these patients that are going to be coming in? Yeah. So, so what we've done in, so we're doing a case or two a day that's not deferrable in terms of cardiac surgical cases. The cardiac, traditionally cardiac surgery unit is now a mixed cardiology cardiac surgery unit. Some years ago, we merged the coronary care unit and the cardiac surgical unit into a heart center ICU so that we've had the philosophy of functioning as one unit for quite some time. I think that facilitated our ability to do this, but uh, the, what was traditionally the CCU is now a, a COVID unit. And uh, all of our cardiac care is being delivered in that ICU. Um, so that's, that's what day-to-day -day life is like right now, but of course it changes so, uh, so rapidly. We're involved, uh, I'm involved with the blood bank too. That's one of the issues, one of the real concerns. In addition to thinking about ICU resources, what are we, how are we gonna manage our, our uh, blood resources? Right now the blood bank is fat and happy because they've got lots of blood on stock. Of course, that's because we're not using it. We're not doing cardiac surgery cases or many, um, uh, but we're trying to prepare for uh, what may be a significant limitation in blood uh, since people don't less. So it's inescapably, I think there's gonna be a drop in the, in the blood supply. 
So that mirrors very much where we're at, including, I think we now have a, I think it's fair to say a couple of hundred spare empty beds in the hospital and the plan to expand the hospital capacity to, you know, by about 30 or 40%. Um, so it's like the quiet before the storm. As you were sort of right. changing your operating practice, how did you frame that conversation with patients, that sort of balance of risks between operating now versus deferring potentially um, really pretty critical surgery? Yeah, I, I think in general, the patients are quite understanding of it. Um, and uh, we just, uh, I, saw, I saw a patient on Friday who has uh, severe three vessel disease and, and really has uh, angina with minimal, minimal effort. And I thought that he would, could not safely be deferred for two months or who knows. That's, that, of course, is one of the challenges is we don't know how long this is going to last. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do his, uh, his operation tomorrow. Um, but in general, patients appreciate that you're, that you're holding off. So you mentioned a patient with critical three vessel disease and symptoms. Which other elective patients did you feel really couldn't be held off uh, six to eight weeks or indefinitely? Sure. So we've set up some criteria. Uh, uh, symptomatic aortic stenosis um, certainly is, is, a, is a dangerous situation, uh, certainly if it's angina syncope. And even, uh, even, uh, even uh, 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 congestive failure, I think. Symptomatic aortic stenosis, I think, is a scary thing to put off. Uh, we've thought that uh, ascending aortic aneurysms that are six centimeters need to be fixed, but less than that, we're holding off on for right now. Um, and other than that, uh, it's really case by case types of things. Yeah, I think additionally, we may be advocated hard for patients with ventricular dysfunction, if they, even if they were asymptomatic with um, severe valve lesions. Um, but it's been an interesting dialogue with clinical leadership throughout the hospital, because when we haven't been the only ones involved in this conversation about triage, who in your hospital was involved in those level of decisions? What kind of framework did you use? Sure. Well, the first layer is within the, with the surgeons themselves, and we talk as a group amongst ourselves. We've also instituted something that I think has been helpful, is on, uh, we do it Thursday mornings at 9.30, that's typically our our late start day for didactics, so there are some reasons for that. But um, once a week, uh, we have a very open conversation with anesthesia, with OR nursing, with ICU nursing, with the intensivists, and talk about the cases that we plan to do next week. Now, things come up, cases come up, but at least that way, everyone on the team has heard about it, because what I don't want to have happen is uh, a perfusion can be is on the call. It's a very open call. Um, I don't want anybody in the operating room or in the ICU rolling their heads and thinking, "Well, I can't believe they they are doing this case." By having a, an open this collective discussion, it's we are doing that case, not we all of this us the whole entire team uh, are doing the case. So I think that's something that's that's uh, been useful and and the. Uh, I think others in the, in the hospital are going to start doing that as well. And how have you approached transplants and how do you think you will going forward? So um, lung transplant is, of course, a challenge until we can uh, effectively screen the donors. Uh, so that's, that's put a real kink in the, in the lung transplant uh, program for right now. Hearts we've continued to do. Um, uh, just because if, uh, well, the obvious reason, if you don't use that organ, some, someone's going to die. We're in a resource limited, uh, organ limited situation. So we're continuing to do transplants and just trying to house them down in our, our unit, um, separate from the COVID patients. It's a challenge though. It's, it's anxiety provoking that you're going to put these people on immunosuppression in the setting of, of this epidemic. One of the things that gave us pause for thought was exactly that. How do we cohort not just patients, but potentially even care providers between um, COVID units and the most immunocompromised um, high-risk patients, which are namely our heart transplant patients? Yeah, yeah. so we're, um, in terms of providers, uh, we're, we're, we haven't really cohorted the, the, um, the physician staff, the surgeon staff, um, 
uh, we're, th that's just whoever needs to come in, uh, uh, comes in. Uh, the nursing staff is a huge, huge limitation um, uh, in, in the hospital. I think that's gonna be the biggest limitation that we face with this uh, is the nursing staff. And, uh, and they've not, they're, they're focused in our unit, so they're cohorted to that, that degree. They're not floating one day to a COVID unit and the next to a non-COVID unit. Um, but that's, that's the best we can do, I think. And what's your approach to ECMO for cardiogenic shock or ARDS in, in COVID? Yeah, yeah. So the, um, uh, we, we had a discussion actually just yesterday about ECMO and what role we play in New England as a resource. Uh, we're certainly the largest ECMO program in, in New England. Um, and uh, it turns out that information that we were discussing yesterday is that actually relatively few patients wind up needing ECMO uh, and the ones who do are in deep, deep trouble, unfortunately. So we have a couple of patients on VV ECMO right now in, in our, um, in our uh, medical ICU, not in, the, in our uh, cardiac surgical ICU uh, that are on for COVID. Uh, we continue to, to provide ECMO for cardiogenic shock if we need to. Uh, staff are cannulating, not residents. Um, the, uh, we minimize the number of providers that are in the, in the room at the time of the cannulation. Uh, but um, it looks like uh, ECMO is not um, is not required uh, very often in this setting, it, as it turns out. At least that's what it looks like so far. We'll see. Unless you're at the PTA hospital in Paris, which according to the ELSA website has got 50 patients right now on ECMO for COVID out of a total of well, I, 72. I don't know if it's... Yeah, I don't know if this is accurate, but I, I was given to understand there are only 40 patients in, in New York City that are on, on ECMO right now. I think um, it's the ELSA website, you're, you're right. We're using it, I think, far more sparingly than many places, and the results haven't been encouraging anecdotally. Um, yeah. Do you have specific advice right now for surgical teams and surgeons that are um, preparing for surge? What should they be thinking so, about? What was surprising well, uh, to the planning process? What's been most surprising yes. to me? Yeah, I think that uh, I think it's actually been very gratifying. It's amazing to see people come together in this way. It's a it's a privilege to to function in that. It's, I think it's bringing out the best in everyone. Um, it's remarkable the camaraderie and the spirit and uh, and uh, so that's been been uh, it's uh, I think it, it's the the silver lining to this. It uh, restores your faith and remind you why you went into medicine in the first place. If you feel like uh, you're going into battle on behalf of the, of the patients. So I think that, uh, I think that that's, uh, I'm surprised and, and pleased at how, how good it feels to be, be part of the healthcare team at a, at a crisis like this. We really are the key players, all of us, the entire team in facing this. And you've thought a lot and written about a lot about human factors and leadership. Any words of advice for leaders of teams in this crisis? I think, um, well, it's easy to say communication, um, but I think uh, a big part of that is listening, and that might be something that, that we as surgeons don't always do as well. We're better at telling than we are at listening sometimes, um, and I think the power of listening Listening, listening to people's stories, going up to someone and asking how they are, and actually listening to them, and 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 ask the next question. Uh, most of us, how are you doing? I'm fine, uh, but well, tell me more. How's your family? Uh, something like that, and you'll you'll see people open up and 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 share a bit more. And I think that that really uh, feeds our souls, uh, supports our souls. So as leaders. I think that we need to demonstrate that kind of, of empathy openly and support the, the heroes that we work with that come in into the hospital every day. I think that's, uh, that's probably the best advice that I can give is be sure that you're open to listening to what people have to say and really listen to them. I think that's tremendous advice in a crisis and, and in normal um, times, but particularly so now. <laughs> We ought to be like that all the time. Unfortunately, we're not. Hopefully, it brings out the best in us. It, it's been virtually impossible to get um, people that were in the thick of this um, to 
find at any time. Um, so your insights are valuable, they're, they're appreciated, and thank you very much. And I hope to all listening that you'll find more resources on the CTSNet um, COVID pages. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tor. Thank you. Thank you.